so far. Um, my title is maybe a little bit general because I was hoping to cram two different talks in, into this, but it'll really be about this one paper here uh, with Tom Redelius and the Cornell group, uh, Naomi, Liam, and Jakob, uh, about really the weak gravity conjecture. <clears throat> Although this is also connected to other Schlumpen conjectures. Okay. Good. So let me just quickly review the weak gravity conjecture, mainly to establish conventions. So the kind of canonical statement is that for every gauge field, there's some super extremal charged particle. And in this talk, I always mean super extremal to be comparing to an extremal black hole. So unlike what Timo was doing in his talk, because these will not always be the same. Um, let me compare that with, so this is kind of the, the imprecise statement. Let me make a slightly more precise statement which is that the weak gravity conjecture, the mild conjecture is saying that for every direction in the charge lattice, there has to be some multi-particle state. Okay, this, you can think of this as the convex hull condition. That's kind of a, a picture of this condition. You have multi-particle states for every leg along this convex hull. Okay, so the tower weak gravity conjecture is like the mild weak gravity conjecture, but we replace multi-particle with single particle. So now for every direction in charge space, we have to have some single particle super extremal state. And this is required if we want to preserve, excuse me, this is required if we want to preserve the weak gravity conjecture on compactification. So here's a sketch of that, which I'm not going to go through right now. <clears throat> it's also related to the emergence of uh, weak coupling, particularly weak gauge coupling at low energies. So this tower of particles will make the gauge coupling weak through renormalization and kind of arranges to make the, weak, the tower of gravity conjecture true. And it plays nicely, for example, with the distance conjecture. So it gets along well with some other swamp line conjectures. Now the sublattice weak gravity conjecture is yet another rearrangement. Now, instead of having here for every <clears throat> side in the charge lattice, there's some integer with a multiple of that being super extremal. Now we take this integer outside and say this integer is a property of the theory. We call it the coarseness. So there's some single integer such that k times any charge, there's a super extremal particle of that charge. Okay, well, why do we care about this conjecture? Well, this is just a theorem in the electric Neverschwartz Neverschwartz sector of string theory. So actually a sketch of what you need for a proof even appears in the original weak gravity conjecture paper then the details about modular invariance were really worked out in these pa two papers. And then there's one crucial point, which is this, this tower has to be super extremal. That's not actually figured out in these papers. That will appear hopefully very soon in a paper that's perennially to appear with my postdoc or former postdoc now, Matteo de Tito. Um, we're just trying to get, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's to make sure that we have everything in place for this, this proof for tree level string theory. Okay, this coarseness is not supposed to be ever too large, although we don't have any sharp bounds on it. And let me also point out that all the examples with the non-trivial coarseness that we know about are basically orbifolds. So there might be something there. So the other thing that's interesting about this sub-lattice conjecture is the strongest form of the weak gravity conjecture that doesn't have any counterexamples that we know about yet, in d bigger than equal to five. And four dimensions is a little bit different because of some RG effects. Okay, so most of the evidence that exists up to recently for these conjectures is perturbative in nature. For example, I told you that it's a theorem in tree level string theory. And I also told you it was related to the emergence of weak coupling. Right? These are all perturbative things. So the question is, is this just a property of weak coupling limits? Is it not anything to do with non-perturbative physics? Uh, I'm gonna argue that that's not true. And the way I'm gonna argue that is by looking for non-perturbative evidence. Uh, for these conjectures. So to do that, of course, it's hard. But if we look at BPS states, then we have some hope of getting some evidence. Uh, to do that, we have to be careful about the difference between BPS and extremal. So here is the charge to mass ratio for two different photons. There's some region where black holes are. The edge of this region is extremal. 
Whereas over here on the right and on the left, these are the BPS bounds. So they coincide in some places. Whenever I have a BPS black hole, of course it has to be extremal. But in other places they don't coincide. So you know this down here, this is an ex a black hole that's extremal and not BPS. Here's a BPS state that's not extremal. Okay, so infinite towers of BPS particles are fired by those conjectures in the directions where BPS equals extremal. And this I'm going to call the cone of BPS black holes. So this is a cone, to be clear, this is a cone in charge space, not in the Q over M space that I plotted over here. Okay. So infinite towers are required in those directions where BPS equals extremal, and they're not required in other directions. So just to take a very basic example, think about heterotic string theory on a circle. This is the spectrum if we ignore the internal gauge fields and just think about the, the left and right movers on the circle. And here again, we have a BPS bound. We have a black hole region that's a square in this case. And we have BPS black holes here. And then up here, we have non-BPS towers, which are super extremal. These are the things with more left moving charge than right moving charge. Okay, so we see in one almost most basic example that in these directions where BPS is not equal to extremal, it's fine. We don't need towers of BPS particles. We can have towers in non-BPS. And see also Timo's talk about this. Okay. So the tower or sublattice free gravity conjecture is linked to geometry in an interesting way. So we actually first pointed this out many years ago in a paper that doesn't get much attention because we didn't do a whole lot in it, but we did point this out. Uh, if you take M theory on a threefold, uh, you get to some 5 vn equals 1 supergravity EFT. You, if you look at M2 brains wrapped on two cycles of that threefold, they're going to give you BPS particles if they're homomorphic curves. And those are counted by Gopikuma Rafa invariants. So the goal of this talk is to determine the cone of BPS black holes, compare with the GV invariants, and then we can do some strenuous non perturbative slash geometric tests of the tower and sub lattice conjectures. There's no, there's no weak coupling in this picture. Unless we go to some limit of the moduli space, but we won't do that. Okay, so let me just briefly flash this about supergravity to establish some conventions. Here's the 5dn equals 1 supergravity action. I have some scalars, I have some gauge fields, I have some Chern Simons term. Everything here is fixed by this thing called the free potential, which is just built out of the Calabia, the intersection numbers of the Calabia threefold. And this free potential, it's important to note, is exact away from phase transitions. So this is a very powerful statement, which is not true, for example, in four dimensions, but in five dimensions it is. And then once you have the free potential, you can get the moduli space by looking at the slice f equals one. You can get the metric on moduli space as the pullback of this metric here, which involves derivatives of the free potential. And this metric is also the gauge kinetic matrix. Okay, and then there's a BPS bound for particles, and there's also a BPS bound for strings. It turns out it's often convenient rather than taking a slice where the pre-potential is equal to one to instead projectivize and think about these coordinates as projective coordinates. And the intuition there is that the overall volume is a hypermultiplet. And so it's not, you don't see it in the vector multiplet moduli space. And we just have everything else that's left from the projection. Okay. So let's talk about phase transitions. I told you that the pre-potential is exact away from phase transitions, but what happens there? Uh, so, we can have a kind of phase transition called a flop, where I have some number of hypermultiplets becoming massless. And in this case, the intersection numbers or the prepotential is going to shift when I pass through this locus where the mass of the of those hypermultiplets change size. This is a well-known effect that when you have, you know, in odd dimensions, when you have a fermion mass that changes sign, it corrects the turn sign term of a charge fermion that is. Okay. So these are flop transitions, and I'm going to let K be the extended Kähler cone, which is what I get from gluing the Kähler cone together with all the flop transitions. So I'm going to connect all of these different phases by gluing together these flops. I can also have a different kind of flop, so to speak, which is when I have some vectors that become massless at some point in the moduli space. I'm going to call this a vial flop. And the reason is because when that happens, I get a non-abelian gauge enhancement. So for example, SU2 would be the most basic one. And the two sides of this flop are related by the vowel group of that non-abelian enhancement. Okay, that actually means it's redundant. 
right? You know, I don't even have to talk about the other side of this plot, but there's a good reason for doing so, which is that when I talk about black holes, I'm going to use the attractor mechanism. And the attractor for the black hole can actually hide behind this file plot. Because when I do this reflection, I also change the black hole charge. So for some fixed black hole charge, the attractor might also it might actually be sitting behind that file plot. So it's important to keep track. Okay. So how do we find the mass of extremal black holes? So this is a an old and long story. So I'm not going to tell you all the references. I'm just going to give you a review. You can also find in our weak gravity review. So it turns out we have to do is solve this PDE. Oops. So I would look for a solution to this PDE. Unfortunately, there's many solutions, but I want one such that this gradient flow has this nice property where W stays positive. And that's actually very constraining. And then I look for amongst all the such solutions, there might be more than one. There's not uncountably many usually, but there might be more than one. I look for the one with the smallest W and that's gonna give me the extremality bound. Okay, so in, in nice cases, which are very common, I can actually find this W by finding a minimum of this Q squared, and that's the attractor point. But sometimes instead of going to some minimum Q squared, it flows off to infinity. And so it's a little bit different in that case, but it's still not drastically different. Okay, so that's what I should do in general. Uh, in the BPS case, fortunately, I already know what this W is. So I don't have to do any work to find that. This is just related to the central charge. Here I've written the central charge in projective coordinates. So I need to put this power of F here. And also very nicely, the gradient flow has an exact solution. So here Z is slightly different than the tau I had on the, other, on the previous slide, but you don't need to know the details. You can look them up if you want. It's basically a straight line, but it's a straight line in these dual coordinates, which are related to the first derivatives of the prepotential. Okay, so BPS black holes are going to exist when the central charge stays positive on this whole flow. So for all Z bigger than zero. And let me just note that, you know, I call these things dual coordinates. You might worry, is there actually an invertible map between these normal coordinates and the dual coordinates? And it turns out to be invertible as a consequence of the fact that the extended Keller cone is con convex and the fact that this uh, gauge kinetic matrix is positive definite. And let me just mention, this is not necessarily true at the boundaries, and that means this map can behave funnily at the boundaries of the extended curve. Okay. So when do I get a BPS black hole? Uh, if my attractor point Q lies inside this cone of dual coordinates, this is the moduli space from the perspective of dual coordinates, then it's easy to check, well, the central charge is positive here. So since it's decreasing along the flow, it's obviously positive everywhere, so that's fine. This is an example of a good flow that gives me a BPS black hole. Uh, by contrast, let's suppose this is a boundary that at infinite distance, which turns out to correspond to the prepotential going to zero in homogeneous coordinates. If Q lies outside that boundary, you go through it. It's uh, relatively straightforward to prove that you definitely went through zero before you got there. So this is a bad flow. The central charge has already gone to zero before you got to that boundary and you do not get a BPS black hole. There. A different way that you can get a BPS black hole is if you have a boundary with an SE2 enhancement here, one of these vial flops, and you can flow into the vial image, like I mentioned before. And as long as you're still inside the moduli space here, or this you know, vial extended moduli space, then you still get a good flow of that. There's one other case, which is a little bit more confusing, which is if you have a boundary here where a non-trivial CFT appears, so you know, one of your U1s is becoming strongly coupled here, at least one, uh, then it's hard to decide, unless it happens to be that you've already gone through zero before you get to that boundary, it's hard to decide whether you actually have a BPS black hole or not, because you have to understand this system of gravity coupled to the CFT, which is not a problem that I know how to solve. Maybe somebody does, or maybe somebody has to go do it now, or sometime soon, hopefully. Uh, yes, this is a four cycle shrinking to a point, you mentioned. So in, so in 40, you might imagine that you go past it into some non-geometric phase. But these non-geometric phases are not supposed to exist in 5D, or at least the only opinion I can find about it is by Witten. It says they don't seem to. I'm not, I'm not sure that's a, that's a firm conclusion, but nobody knows about them anyway. 
so then it's just a it's a question you know you have you it doesn't necessarily matter what you think is behind here because something might change qualitatively when you reach that CFD boundary in terms of how the black hole solution works. It's an interesting problem, which I would certainly like to know the answer to. We're just going to avoid that. Problem. Okay, so at the very least, this cone of BPS black holes includes the region that's straight line visible from this moduli space. By straight line visible, I mean in dual coordinates, just like this. Right, as long as I can get there along a straight line inside the moduli space, then I get a good flow. I get a BPS black hole. Okay. Yeah, that's inside the moduli space. Indeed, that would mean your K wedge K would be your dual coordinate. And if your charge sits inside the moduli space, so. Uh, yeah, you have to first of all you have to vial extend the moduli space and then you still have to deal um, almost there's a there's a few caveats one is if this extended moduli space is not always convex so sometimes you can't follow a straight line from where you want to start to where you want to end so I'll talk about that later. Right. So if you're going to the vial extended moduli space, you're by assumption you're starting in this domain over here, which is not vial extended. But your charge might be such that the attractor sits over there. If it happens to be in a part of this extended moduli space that you can't reach by a straight line, which can happen, then you don't necessarily have a BPS black hole. Well, again, you just you can choose a gauge, right, which puts you in one domain. And in that gauge, your charge might not happen to be in this domain. It might happen to be in some vial group image. I mean, like the fully vial extended thing, which turns out to, in those cases, not be particularly well. So if K is in the extended Kähler cone, then, then there's always a BPS black hole. If K is in the extended Kähler cone, there's always a BPS black hole. If you're doing one of these vial extensions, sometimes yes, sometimes no. So I'm going to make that more precise later in the talk. But yeah, if it's just in the extended Kähler cone, then yes. But it's not an if and only if, because sometimes you do have this case. So there are definitely okay. cases where it's not in the extended Kähler cone and you do have the BPS black hole. So the cases yeah. Those ones for sure have BPS black holes, but there are others which do too. Yeah, no, I, and what I told you about the flows and such, this is the supergravity. Right? So when I say there's a good flow, that means I understand in the supergravity. Right, but when you do that, you reflect your black hole charge. So then your 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 path is not going to be a straight line; it's going to bounce. You could do that. You can do that, but it's the same as analyzing the problem this way. This is just easier. Well, no, from the again from a single gauge perspective, you sit in one valve chamber your charge doesn't have to sit in the same vial chamber as you. That's gauge invariant statement. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that more as we go on anyway. Um, okay. So in order to, to do this kind of test, we want to see if the weak gravity conjecture is the, you know, the sub lattice or tower of gravity conjecture is satisfied, then we have to know what this extended moduli space is. Even without these valve flops, we have to even just get this Extended Kähler cone and the dual coordinate image of it. And then we might want to go beyond this and think about this file extended moduli space that gives us a, a broader region where there are still BPS black holes, so a stronger test of the weak gravity conjecture. Okay. So this is a non trivial problem to map out this whole extended Kähler cone, much less these file group images. Uh, it turns out we can solve this problem. Um, oops using just the free potential and the genus zero GV invariance for a single phase. And we can use that to reconstruct the other phases. So that's what I want to tell you about. That's what this paper was mostly about. 
Okay, so let me define a few things. So let's see, here are the, uh, the GV invariants, and this is our Morricone here. And the red dots are where the GV invariants are non-zero. This is genus zero, GV invariants. Okay, so you can see in some directions, I have infinite powers of them. We call these directions the infinity cone. I really mean the closure of those directions, right? So you can see that there's powers arbitrarily close to this ray here, or indeed parallel to it. And so that closure is still deemed to be inside the infinity cone. Okay, we also have some dots here for which there are not further non-zero GV invariants. So if, you know, for some multiple of this, there are no more non-zero GV invariants, we call it nilpotent. Okay, so there's two examples of nilpotent here. One of them lies outside the infinity, infinity cone, which we, I'm going to call not nilpotent outside potent. It's not my term, it's one of my collaborators' terms, but it works. Uh, and here's a nilpotent curve um, which lies on the boundary of the infinity cone. Okay, so let's think about flopping a knot curve. This is relatively easy. So here's our original Mori cone. And when we change the sign of that mass, we should think about it, you know, as equivalent to changing the sign of the charge. And so here's our new Mori cone. So that doesn't change the value of the GV invariant, it just changes the, the charge that we associate to it. And here's our new Mori cone for our flop phase. And then we can just take the span of the non-zero GVs and figure out what our Mori cone is with the caveat that I'll discuss, discuss in a second. So here, I'm not assuming that I know anything geometrically about this. I'm just using the data from that first phase to construct it. Okay. So the, G, the genus zero GV invariants count the number of hypers minus the number of vectors. So I can't always distinguish between a vial flop where I have vectors and a standard flop where there are no vectors becoming massless. However, I can keep track of how the intersection numbers change because they also depend only on this difference. And in fact, there's going to be some flops we can call n equals four flops where the number of hypers and the number of vectors are the same. And they just don't notice them at all in this picture because they don't change the intersection numbers. They don't give you non-zero GV invariants. For our purposes, you can just ignore them and think of the Mori cone as being bigger. It's not really the Mori cone, but it's some kind of extended Mori cone. So we might not be able to identify exactly the Mori cone, but it works for what we want to do. Okay, what about flopping one of these nilpotent curves that lie on the boundary of the infinity cone? Well, if you're just naive and you try to do it, this is what your Mori cone you're going to get, which is obviously not good. It's not convex, which means the Kähler cone couldn't be full dimensional. And that's, in this case, it would just be a point. So that can't be right. What actually has to happen is wall crossing. As you do this vial flop, you go to a gauge equivalent phase, but you can track the BPS states as you do that. And you see that they don't respect the vial symmetry, meaning that there has to be wall crossing as you go through that vial flop in order to, you know, the actual BPS states on the other side obviously have to be the vial reflection of what you started doing. And you can argue that this is only possible if there's a tensionless string, which there is for a vial flop because you have a total polycoff monopole strings. So this could not be an ordinary flop. It has to be a vial flop in this case. What's the argument? Well, let me, uh, I, I don't think much is known about 5D wall crossing and I've asked a number of people and so has Tom, for example, including famous people. You can imagine how it might work with a string. You might have some particle and it kind of like loses a string going off to infinity in some loop or something. And this could carry away some electric charge for those uh, things that are becoming light here. Why should there be a string? Well, if you look at 4D, wall crossing always involves magnetic charge. And so if it just happened in 5D with purely electric charge, that wouldn't be consistent with what we know about 4D wall crossing. So for whatever reason, it seems like you always have to have a string for this wall crossing to happen. And here we do for this file flop. So it's consistent with that at least. Okay. So we can observe at least from the GV invariance when it happens and when it doesn't, at least in terms of wall crossing and the GV invariance. And let me call the vial flops, which are associated with these not curves, so they're not on the infinity cone. I'll call them stable, so we don't see wall crossing there. And you can prove that the, the GV invariance can't change there. Um, and these ones that lie on the edge of the infinity cone, if they, in particular, if they generate it, let me call them unstable vial flops. And then we have wall crossing at these. And I'm going to define the hyperextended Kähler cone. So this is a further extension, not just the extended Kähler cone, which is going to be the union of all the vowel group images under the stable vowel flops, only the stable. 
And so by uh, construction, there's no GV wall crossing within the hyperextended gutter front. And we'll see it has other nice properties as we go on. And one of the nice things about this is we can construct it and the extended Kähler cone, we can't reconstruct with the GVs because we can't tell the difference between, we can only see the difference in the number of vectors and the number of hypers. So there's a nice relationship between this hyperextended Kähler cone and the infinity cone that I already defined. So by construction at every boundary of this hyperextended Kähler cone, there's either one of these nilpotent curves on the boundary of C infinity, or I have some infinite tower of VPS particles becoming massless, which of course also would have to be on the boundary of the infinity cone. And this could be either because you're going to infinite distance or there's a CFD boundary there. Um, and this can't happen in the interior. So that means that the hyperextended Kähler cone is precisely the, the dual, cone dual of the infinity cone. That means, for example, that this guy is uh, convex. So it has a lot of the same properties that the extended Kähler cone has. And if you try to overextend by looking at these unstable valve flops and adding on their images, you just don't retain these properties in general. So you know, here we could prove it. And in general, it's just not true. So that's why I like to call this overextending, because it doesn't behave nicely anymore. But fortunately, we can tell the difference between a stable and unstable valve flop from the GVs, and so we don't have to, to overextend. We can just look at the type extended killer cone. Okay, so let's talk about the cone of BPS black holes. Um, so you might want to know, so from my previous conversation with Thurman, you already know that the cone of BPS black holes includes the cone of dual coordinates, which you could otherwise uh, call the uh, cone of movable curves, although I haven't told you why exactly that's true, but it is. Um, you might want to know whether it includes also the hyperextended cone of dual coordinates. That's just the dual coordinate image of this hyperextended Kähler cone. So this would be bigger. That depends on whether this thing is convex. So I told you that this is convex, but that doesn't mean that this is. In practice, it seems to be, but we don't have a proof. But if you look at examples, it seems to be convex. And I think it probably is in general, but I don't have a proof for you. So you might worry, well, is this going to cause trouble later? It's important to know if it's convex to know whether I always have these good black hole solutions because if it's not convex, I can hit the boundary when I try to get somewhere else in the moduli space. Okay, but it doesn't actually matter because we know the GV invariants don't wall cross within the hyperextended Kähler cone. So that means I can define a different object, which isn't quite the cone of BPS black holes at any point. It's the union of them at all the different points across this hyperextended moduli space. And because there's no GV wall crossing, I just go to a point that I'm interested in, and I know that you know the charge for that point is certainly a BPS black hole. That's just a Reister Nordstrom solution. And since there's no GV wall crossing, that means I'm going to have to have infinite towers there everywhere else in the moduli space as well. Okay. So that means that I'm going to predict infinite GV towers in particular everywhere within this hyperextended cone of dual coordinates. Okay, let's just state it again here. It's actually a possibly bigger set. In some cases, it is bigger, where there's still definitely BPS black holes. And that's every point that's visible through these different uh, vial flops from this hyperextended uh, hyper dual coordinate cone. So when I say visible, I mean you're going through now unstable vial flops. And there are some examples where this is a bigger set. In fact, I'll show you an example later. And you still have BPS black hole solutions for these. There's no reason you can't do that from the supergravity perspective. Nothing, nothing bad happens. You know, all that wall crossing is happening to massive BPS states. They're not becoming massless. Yet. Okay. So now let's go and uh, check the sublattice or tower of weak gravity conjecture. So for every Calabria threefold that we consider, we should first find the infinity cone. And so then from that, we can deduce the hyperextended Kähler cone. Then we should map out the intersection numbers slash the free potential for every different phase by just flopping all the curves that we see in the GV invariance. Right? We look at all the not curves and we, we flop them starting from one phase where we know the free potential. Once we know the free potential, we can figure out this T map to go from the hyperextended Kähler cone to the hyperextended cone of dual coordinates. And we could also work out from this, the, the region that's visible from that through unstable valve flops 
but this is not something we've automated. So we can do this by hand in examples, but not in some big computer search at the moment. Okay, then we just go and check, are there any non-zero GVs within either this hyperextended cone of Google coordinates or the region visible from it, depending on whether we're doing this by hand or automated, up to some specified cutoff degree. Of course, we can't do this to arbitrary degree because we have to do it on computer with some finite amount of time. Okay. Now, I said check every site. So if none of these things vanish, then actually the lattice weak gravity conjecture is satisfied for those directions. Okay. So one caveat before I show you the results quickly is sometimes the flop phase is isomorphic to the phase you started with. For example, and this is typically how it happens by a reflection. So this is definitely what happens for valve flops, but it also happens for some other flops which are not valve flops. And you can improve the efficiency of your search if you don't go through all these flops. Instead, you restrict to some fundamental domain for all these reflection symmetries. So for example, here's an example of, um, uh, I think in this case, just the extended Keller cone, there's no hyperextension to do. And these are symmetric flops here and here. And in fact, that means that so is that, and so is that, and so is that, on and on and on. And this is a fundamental domain for those reflection symmetries. There's two of these symmetries, they don't commute, so they generate an infinite order group in this case. Actually, it turns out there's yet another reflection symmetry that just doesn't lie at a flop. It lies in the middle between the two. And that makes the fundamental domain even smaller. Okay. And this also illustrates that not only can we do this to make the search more efficient, if we don't do this, we're going to have a lot of trouble because we have infinitely many phases to explore. That's not good for a computer. So we really have to do this. Okay. So let me flash some examples quickly, and then I'll tell you the results of our search. Here's an example, which you can do by hand or on a computer if you want. There's just one knob curve here. Uh, we start off with some hypersurface and a uh, toric variety. And when you flop through this, you get something which is not a hypersurface and toric variety. So it's something you wouldn't have found on the Kurtzis Karka list, for example. You get some non toric phase. Here's the hyperextended cone of dual coordinates. Every guy is non zero here, so we're happy. Here's a different example. Again, oops, toric hypersurface. And uh, in this case, we have another uh, nilpotent curve, but it's an unstable valve flop. So it lies inside the infinity cone. In this case, that's the whole Mori cone. And here's the uh, hyperextended cone of the coordinates. And here's the region visible from it, which is bigger. And as you can see, if I go back there, uh, everything is non-zero in here. So everything works still, just by hand. Okay, so we do a full scan. Uh, everything in the course of Skarka list, H11 less than or equal to four, and so certain favorable cases for H11 equals five. You can see our algorithm is picking up a lot of non toric phases. So those phases are not on the list. We're just accessing them by, by reconstructing the, job, the flops. Um, and as you go harder, higher in H11, there's more and more of them that are non toric. Okay, so we had 2,062 2, C geometries, and among those, we found no counterexamples to even the lattice weak gravity conjecture. This is kind of surprising because we know that the lattice weak gravity conjecture is just not true in general. There are counterexamples, they're orbifolds, they're almost really simple counterexamples. Um, and it's, it's kind of a puzzle. Maybe there's some underlying principle. Maybe there's some reason why you know, the lattice conjecture is not true, but some kind of improvement of it is perhaps. Okay. Well, I guess the timing works out just about right. I was going to talk about something else, but I didn't make the slides and I don't have time left. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you said that that's we I think you take this point to be a point of the example for us. Take a G cross D2 and all of the, the, uh, the evolution minus an acting on D2 and minus acting on one of the things on D2 and then when you see the translation, we know it's fine. But we call it, and I think that, that's one of that I mean, we know there are counterexamples even with 16 supercharges, so I wouldn't be surprised if what you're saying were. You must be that maybe. Yes. I think maybe all of these Calabias have trivial fundamental groups. And if we look at ones with a non trivial fundamental group, this is from the Kreutzer Skarka database, right? But I'm not even sure if that's true, but. Um, 
I, there's something special yeah, about that. Yeah, the one I can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so something a little bit more bigger than the movable cone, uh, but yes, that's right. And we look to some finite degree, of course, because we have to do it on a computer and get on the computer. So there's some directions where we don't know if BPS equals extremal or not. Some directions where you know it's not. And of course, we don't do anything with those directions, nor for the ones where we don't know. And then, of course, we also only go to finite degrees. That's what we're doing. And what's the most important about what you think is the mind-free when you watch the thing that tells you when you have a Well, I think it's. You know, there's a reason I mentioned that all the counterexamples seem to be oracles. Something going on there. I have hunches and even working on something, but it's not ready for the light of day yet. So I don't know. It has to. I think we don't. Uh, that's what I said, said the crewman, right? I think that non trivial pi one would be a good place to look for a counterexample. Okay. 